Corey um, for the Corey Bush for Congress campaign. Yay. Um, I have my non-coffee, I'm fancy like that, mug. Um, because I don't drink coffee. I'm not a caffeine person because um, I'm already hype enough. Um, so I have a smoothie in here. So um, that's my thing for tonight. But, but, but for all you coffee drinkers, shout out to you. <laughs> okay. So um, welcome, welcome, welcome. And um, I um, want to introduce... Um, tell you all about someone. I'm gonna have her go ahead and go back and, um, and introduce herself. But I have a sister um, in the fight and um, she is absolutely amazing, um, phenomenal. I love her. Um, I love her like a sister. I love her um, like, a, you know, like a auntie and a cousin all at the same time. She is so wonderful. Her name is Dr. Victoria Dooley. Um, she is, look at her, she's so beautiful. Um, she is um, out of Michigan and um, she does, she'll tell her story. Um, but I will say this about Dr. Dooley before I uh, really get started. Um, when Dr. Dooley and I met, uh, you know, of course, we really didn't know each other. We had seen each other, you know, tweeting and that kind of a thing. But um, we immediately just jailed when we when we met. Um, she was uh, she's a national surrogate for Bernie Sanders. Um, um, uh, we were both doing that together, and she's just uh, just phenomenal. But I will say this: she um, she is one of the reasons why I am still here today, and I can say that because. Uh, I have my own COVID-19 story and um, as I was going through a situation with uh, just this really bad, horrible um, like bout with pneumonia, uh, Dr. Dooley made a phone call one day. She just called just to check up on me and when she heard how, how I was breathing, she got on the phone and called 911 from Detroit trying to have them send an ambulance to Saint to my home in St. Louis. So that's the kind of person she is. Um, and we're gonna come back to Dr. Dooley in just a second and she's gonna talk to you all a bit. Um, so the reason why we're having this call tonight, um, I want to make sure that everybody um, um, understands that there is two sides to who was multiple sides to who I am, but one, big part of who I am is I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse, I'm a parent. Um, I'm someone that just loves the community and loves to serve. And so when COVID-19 hit, um, you know, it, it what COVID-19 did for me was it, it was almost like a, you know, um, kind of like I've been trying to tell you was coming like like you all have been on the right track with what you've been, what you've been asking for from our government what you've been requiring you know from the healthcare system you've been right on target with it it's just that that thing hasn't happened and for quite a few people they people felt like oh it'll never happen or you know we don't really understand the need um COVID-19 has changed a lot of that uh Dr. Dooley and I have been um advocates for Medicare for all um and we are, we, we don't waver on that. Um, so I'm running for the seat for U.S. Congress because people matter. And I believe that the only way we show that people matter and people over profit and people over property and people over, you know, we can all the P's, you know, the only way that we can show that is when we start having people that are in those seats to go ahead and make that change that are willing to do that. So um, for me, it's, um, I'm running against somebody right now who has been in the seat for 20 years. Right now, it's, it's about nostalgia. It's about, oh, well, you know, this is the name that we know, or, you know, we have to be loyal. You know, we have to get rid of that because this is the, this is the thing. Dr. Dooley and I have been all across this country talking about a Medicare for all, holding town halls because we both believe that um, your health care should not be tied to your job status. We both believe that you should have health care regardless of your, your, um, your race, your gender, your social status, you know, your sexuality, you know. Um, and so we're trying to get rid of this nostalgia 
and actually get something real for you all. Because the other person that's running is not doing a lot for Medicare for all other than signing saying that I, you know, I support. Um, but while, while that person is saying I support, we're out fighting for it. And I think that that makes a difference. Um, so healthcare is my, is my top priority because I've seen my patients die. They're dying just simply because they don't have access to the health care. You know, um, I see my patients sitting um, sitting in the clinic wondering, do I take this money and spend it on my or do I take this money and, and pay my rent? Um, I've had mothers who have, I have this one mother who, she, will, she came in with her four children. This woman was suffering from um, chronic mental illness. She made it to the clinic. Now, I don't know if anybody here understands how deep that is, but she made it to the clinic without her own transportation, with four small stair-step stair, stair children. She got there to the clinic, and she sat there in the waiting room for like two or three hours with those children before she saw the doctor. She made it in to see the doctor, and then she came out just to find out that her medications, she was not going to be able to afford them. That's violence on our communities. That woman, she went, she, she showed up because she wanted help. So I'm running because I want to fight for it. I want to champion the things that you need. Now let's have, um, uh, well, before I do that, um, one more thing. This campaign does not accept not a dime of corporate money, not a dime of lobbyist money. We are 100% people funded. 100% people powered. And one of those reasons is the pharmaceutical company. These healthcare systems cannot be, uh, they can't own us. The day that I walk in to Congress, if I'm elected, nobody will own me. Nobody will have, no, nobody will, nobody can say, okay, now that I, now that you took my money, now you owe me and you have to vote this way. I'm only accountable to the people. I'm only accountable to you. Um, uh, really briefly, um, I am the people that I serve and I say that a lot. A, a lot. And I say that because um, if you don't know my background, I'm someone who um, I grew up in a household where my father's been in politics for most of my life. And I think my father is on here. If you are, hey dad. Um, and my father was boosted to the ground. He did the work, you know, and that was my example. But I also saw him take a lot of hits, a lot of darts came at him just because he was trying to help people. Um, and so I said I would never do politics. I went into ministry. Um, but I had a hard road. I ended up being someone, I was unhoused. I lived unhoused. I remember there were days where I didn't have food. You know, I made sure my children were fed, um, but I didn't eat myself. You know, I've, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Um, I've been on food stamps and I've been low wage. I worked low wage for 10 years. I've been uninsured. I'm uninsured right now while I'm running this race. Um, and I just went through pneumonia. So with two hospital stays. So this is why I'm fighting because I am the people that I serve and I, I've been through so much and I don't want other people to have to go through those things. So with that, Dr. Dooley, Dr. Dooley, would you please introduce yourself and tell the people about you and what you're doing in, in Novi, Michigan? Absolutely, Corey. It is so good to see you, sister. I miss you. I miss you. It wasn't that many months ago that we were stomping together with yes. our girl, Amy Valella. Yes. Um, but it seems like it was so long ago. And just to see your beautiful face and your makeup is flawless. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. To see you smiling and laughing and breathing, right? It feels good to breathe, doesn't it? Feels good it? to breathe. It feels good uh, to breathe. So I am a family medicine physician. I am a healthcare activist, and um, why am I so outspoken about Medicare for All and healthcare activism? Um, I don't see how I could not be. Um, when you look at healthcare in this nation and how we're so many people are un in, uninsured and how it disproportionately affects people of color, people who look like me and you. Um, I did my training in Detroit, Michigan and Flint, Michigan. And so I saw how just the city of Detroit, the uninsured rate for the city of Detroit is twice as high as the uninsured rate for the state of Michigan. So it's, it's a huge issue that, that weighs heavy on my heart. I treated some of those patients in Flint, Michigan who delivered babies who were subsequently poisoned by lead water and to, to, to give them a solution as we're gonna give you Medicaid. Um, to me, that's unacceptable. That, that tells everybody that they're poor, right? When you have a Medicaid card, what does it say? It says that you're low income. 
Um, and to me, that's not healthcare justice. Healthcare justice is being able to go to any doctor, any hospital, any clinic that you want to, and for them to not judge you based off of some letters or some words in your health insurance card. Everyone is worthy in this country. And what I'm seeing a lot of in my practice in Michigan, we have one of the highest uninsured rates in the country due to this COVID pandemic. I'm going to say about 2% now. And I'm having a lot of patients who know we should hear from them because, you know, my practice is kind of small. We're like family, right? So we have some people we haven't heard from in a while. We're calling them and saying, hey, you know, just call to make sure you're okay. And we're learning that um, they're not okay. They lost their job. They're uninsured. And um, they didn't reach out to us because uh, it's embarrassing and they didn't know what we were going to be able to do for them with them being uninsured. And of course, anybody who was in my practice and became uninsured because of the pandemic, we're going to take care of you. Um, it, but it shouldn't be like that in this wealthiest nation in, in, in the country. Um, there's an alternate universe where people are not only getting guaranteed health care during this pandemic, but they're getting UBI. They're getting like $2,000 a month. This uh, alternate universe is called Canada. Has anybody heard about it? <laughs> so um, there is a better way. We are one of the wealthiest nations in the world. And it's time that we treat human beings like human beings. And for somebody to say, um, you, we want to give you choice by keep, keeping your private health insurance. And if you like your private health insurance, you should be able to keep it. Well, what about the millions of people who lost their health insurance but wanted to have it because they lost their jobs because of this pandemic? I have young women who worked in retail. And in Michigan, um, our state has been on lockdown for a long time. And they lost their job in retail. And with losing their job, they lost their health insurance. And um, uh, with unemployment, yes, um, Senator Sanders championed getting up some more money for unemployment. But as people who are telling me it's taken five, six weeks to get their unemployment check, what are you supposed to do in that time period? How are you supposed to eat and pay your bills? Um, so to me, healthcare activism is just, I don't see how more doctors aren't as outspoken as I am about it. Um, not only am I a physician, but I'm a social worker, I'm a minister, I'm a counselor, um, because I care. Um, I went into this profession for the right reason because I wanted to help serve people. And I believe that I should be able to go to work and take care of and show anybody who comes to my office, regardless of their health insurance, because just simply because they're a human being. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the day that we have Medicare for all in these United States. I'm not giving up because of wonderful people like you, Corey, my sister, we are going to make it happen. And I'm so proud to support you in your race. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, um, you know, one thing that um, I have to uh, shout out, I have to shout out you and your husband and all the other, um, you know, healthcare professionals that are, you know, still working that are out, you know, on those front lines and, you know, and whether you're working in a hospital or a clinic, you know, um, whether you're uh, working home health, you know, you're still interacting with patients. And so, um, you know, just shout out to you for continuing to see patients, you know, even as you're doing telemedicine. Uh, and um, I think about, you know, while I was sick, um, you know, so, initially remember everything you know nobody we, we we all were kind of just like wondering what really is this you know what are the real symptoms for this thing you know how do you get rid of it you know can there be a vaccine like all of these questions do you wear a mask don't wear a mask all of that and we'll get to that in a moment um but when this hit me it was in the very it was you know in the early stages of this thing really hitting the u.s um and then hitting missouri and so we didn't have much information and i just remember thinking something that I know, Dr. Dooley, that you've seen, and the people on this call, you may be this person as well, where when that thing hit me, it hit me like a train. I couldn't breathe. I had all these other symptoms, but I said, I'm not going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, you know, I don't have insurance. I don't want that bill. Let me go. You know, first I was going to try to wait it out. So I waited it out the first day. And then the second day, it was so terrible. I couldn't. So I went to the urgent care. I went to the urgent care and I paid my cash um, and to be seen and they, you know, patched me up, you know, gave me a breathing treatment and some meds and did a strep test and did a flu test and sent me out the door. A few hours later, I am <laughs> couldn't breathe again, you know, even worse. So I ended up in the emergency room. So many people fight that. I'm not even, so this is the thing, pre-COVID, you know, 
We, you know, pre-COVID, we were talking about these things. Pre-COVID, we've been talking about the healthcare disparities um, um, within this country and talking about how um, it's, it's more than just having, it's not just about um, access, you know, um, it's about having actual care. You brought up something about, um, um, it, like when we talk about people pulling out their Medicaid cards. One thing that I, I saw as a nurse was, um, I'll, I'll never forget working in places where there is a drawer or certain equipment for people that are uninsured. Yes. There's another drawer for people who have Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And then there's another drawer or more or other equipment for people who have insurance. Yeah. Um, and th that class system is something that has to go away. You know, we, um, and I will always wonder like, what's the difference with this medicine and this medicine? Because you can't tell me it's a lot number because we're, we're, we're more sophisticated than that. So it can't be numbers. You know, it's something, what is the reason why people have different medicines? And what'd you say? It's all costs. It's all about the dollar. Absolutely. It's all about the dollar. And so for me, I'm like, I'm going to the hospital and so many people are fighting that we're fighting that before. Um, I know one thing that you had been working on was um, uh, talking about like um, the black um, maternal mortality rate and yeah. just the disparities. When we look at right now, um, you know, even looking at the numbers locally um, in our district, well, especially the St. Louis city area where I'm from, um, uh, the black community um, are, you know, the most of the cases and actually, and then even higher than that, black women are the one for the cases. And that kind of, that is happening all across the country. And we do understand that there are several re is quite a few reasons for that, you know, um, uh, some of it being, um, you know, whether it's, we, whether we're the essential workers. So we're oftentimes, um, in some cases, we're low wage workers, you know, um, or, and we are we have this and nursing homes and long-term care facilities long -term care. Back in our health care workers. Absolutely. Um, we are, um, we have, and if we've gone to college, we have this huge student debt, black women carry more student debt than anyone. Um, and then also when you're talking about wage inequality, we also don't make the, we don't make our whole dang dollar. We make the 61 cent. So with all of those things put together, and then we also know, and I want you to comment on this. We also know that, women and children um statistically um i think the numbers are the last numbers i've seen is like uh women and children are 14 times as likely to die in, in natural disasters or environmental disasters um 14 times as likely because we don't have the adaptive resources and women are the ones taking care of something so like you just said those essential workers those people working in those nursing homes and all of that you know if, if something happened outside the door we got to go get the patients or we got to go get you know go get that so talk to us about um the disparities and um, what you've been seeing um, well, absolutely. I have had a disproportionate amount of Black females who have came down with COVID because, again, they are essential workers, they're healthcare workers, they're working in nurses' homes, they're LPNs or RNs. And I just want to give a quick shout out to my sister, Nurse Angie. She's an RN like you, Corey. And she's one of our frontline workers taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. And so, um, not, but when you think about black women, not only do we have all these uh, racism that we have to face and we're not making our whole day dollar and, it's, and we're trying to take care of ourselves and our loved ones, but not only about that, but we're worried about our male, the love, love the love, our loved ones who are black males. Uh, we're constantly fearing for our children. I have two black boys and they are big boys. They're tall, like their dad, they're tall. And my 13 year old to me looks like a baby, but a racist white cop is gonna say, oh, he was big and he was intimidated. I was scared. He didn't look like he was 13. Well, my baby absolutely looks like he's 12, 13 years old. So not only do we have to worry about ourselves because there's so many injustices with us, but we have to worry about the men that we love, um, our, our, our fathers, our sons. And so we have all these stressors that we have to deal with. And toxic stress absolutely changes absolutely. our biochemical makeup so that we are more prone to devastating effects of illnesses. And not only that, but healthcare providers don't listen to us. Black women aren't believed. When we come in with pain complaints, when we come in with chest pain and have heart attacks, you know, 50% of black women have some form of heart disease. So we are super high risk. But when we go to the ER with chest pain, we are less likely to be believed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we need people who are not only going to say, hey, everybody deserves health care. And it should be the same good quality health care for all people, regardless of race and income. But not only that, we need 
activists and the government who are going to say, you know what, if you are a healthcare provider and you discriminate against a group of people based on their race or their religion or their sexual preference, you are going to be fined and suffer some consequences. Right. When you think about it, landlords aren't supposed to discriminate against people because of color and religion and things of that nature. So why do we have a system that does not say to doctors or nurses, look, you are going to provide culturally competent based yeah. care or we are not going to allow you to have this job because when you make decisions based off of how somebody looks or their sexual preferences or their religious, you can potentially kill them. We're not talking about the right to rent a home, which is a crucial right, but we're talking about life or death here. So we need people to speak up and say, hey, Everybody has health insurance. It's going to be equal and the resources are going to be spread out equally. But not only that, healthcare providers are going to be put on notice that you have to believe black women. Right. You have to, have to. Um, I, I almost lost both. I only have two children and both of them I almost lost because, for that fact. The first child I almost lost, um, my child was born at 23 weeks. I was 23 weeks gestation. Um, the, I, I went in and said I was in pain and the doctor said, oh no, you're fine. I said, no, I'm, I'm in pain. Your sign says, if you feel like something is wrong, something is wrong, tell your doctor. So I'm telling you, I'm in pain. Something is not right. Oh no, oh, no you're fine. And sent me home. And a week later I was back and had my child. Um, I remember when you told me that story, Corey, and it was so devastating, but it, it, it's just so typical of how we're just brushed off. Um, they don't believe us or, or, you know, the whole myth, yeah, black women are strong, but just because we're strong doesn't mean that we don't ever have any complaints or legitimate concerns. Right. Um, as a, uh, I have a small business, my practice, when I opened my practice, I didn't have health insurance. This was back in 2011 before Obamacare was law. So me as a doctor, I did not have health insurance. Isn't that crazy? I'm a medical doctor and I'm sitting here with no insurance. Um, and I actually got sick one time before I got insurance. And because I was a doctor and I knew doctors, um, they took care of me for free, something called professional courtesy, right? And I'm like, which I appreciate, but it's like, why can't we all as human beings have human courtesy? Or that we can all be taken care of when we have health concerns because we have guaranteed health care as a human right from our government. So it's just insane. It's ridiculous. And, and small business owners, not only that, I almost lost a, a super valuable employee who had been with me since the beginning because I could not offer her health care. So there was a time where I was scared that I was going to lose somebody who wanted to work for me, who somebody who I wanted to keep. Yeah. But was thinking about they might have to leave and go work somewhere where they could get health care. Um, so Medicare for all, not only does it save money, numerous scientific studies have proved that, but it's also going to help small businesses. Um, and if you're a small business owner or if, not, if you're a business owner, period, you don't want somebody working for you who doesn't want to work for you, who's only working for you because of the benefits. Um, when I was traveling the country, I met a lovely black female nurse. She was suffering infertility. She hated her job. She worked for a healthcare company. She hated her job, but that her job paid for fertility treatment. And that is the only reason why she was at that job. So it, it would be better for that company if they had an employee who liked to work there. And it'd be better for her if she was able to work wherever she liked and enjoyed because we all had good comprehensive health care benefits. So Medicare for All isn't just about health care. It's about freedom. The freedom right. to work where you want to work or not work right. and still be taken care of. So it's, it's more than just health care for all. It's freedom. It's empowering. Right. And then some people also see um, like something that um, I would deal with is uh, a, a big part after I, um, I went from hospital work. Um, I was a transplant nurse in a, um, a local hospital and then I went into clinic work. And so at the now at the hospital, we, my health care was OK. But once I switched to the community based clinic, then that was a whole different story. Then it was based upon, you know, how much does the does that you know company want to pay? Um, you know, into the healthcare. And so what they would say is, oh, we have a lot of people who work here who have um, pre-existing conditions. And some of them, you know, we have cancer, we have diabetes, we have lupus, we have all of these things that cost a lot of money. And so it's going to make our premiums higher. So, you know, you all are going to have to pay more because the people that work here are more sickly. Mm -hmm. it's I would hear and so then it's like okay so now I'm paying I have two children it's me and two children and I pay $826 a month you know um and 
uh, just for the, you know, just for my health care, you know, plus everything else that comes along with that. Well, co-pays. Yeah, exactly. The co-pays and all of that, you know, and, and my deductible was like $4,600, you know, so I was like, but the thing is, then it's like, you know, then you, you, um, uh, it's like we punish people. Yes. Um, for things that they didn't ask for. Nobody asked for diabetes. Nobody asked for why is a pre-existing condition. Just you know, when you're a breathing human being, you're gonna eventually get something. Exactly. And so that brings me to a point. Um, so we have this situation right now. Um, this whole mask situation. Uh-huh. Now to mask or not to mask, and I will I you know, I have my opinion about it, but um, uh, I was so I was driving just a little while ago, um, driving um, past a park here in St. Louis, um, the a very uh, well known park here. Mm -hmm. And as I'm driving, people were out jogging and you know, just the regular stuff. And I'm looking and I probably saw maybe 60 people just, just in that little short span that I drove past the park and I saw one person with a mask. Nobody else had on a mask. And so I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, I just kept looking and I'm like, is there a sign somewhere that says you can't wear a mask? You know, because I'm like, who, you know, and, th and so, and, and I think about um, people have said, and I know there may be some people on this call that feel this way, and you know, um, but I, I think about, um, I hear people say, well, you know, it's my freedom. It's my, you know, I, I, you know, that's my freedom to not wear a mask. Um, you know, you can't make me wear a mask. It's my right to not wear a mask. Um, and then, but then I think about, um, we, uh, we wear a shirt. You know, we, you wear pants or a skirt or skirt or shorts or whatever it is you put on your body. You know, when you go to the store or you get kicked out, the sign says no shirt, no shoes, no service. You know? So in the same way, there was a day when women weren't wearing pants. Um, you know, there was a day some long time ago when women weren't wearing pants, you know, and then some, and then that changed. And now, so when, and so now putting on a mask because of what's happening in, in um, right now, um, I think is, um, is a service not only to, um, for yourself and for your family, but it's also for the, for your neighbor. And, and I think about, um, you know, working in the hospital. And so this is the thing, working in the hospital, we would have patients who were, had tuberculosis or possible tuberculosis so if they came in and they had it or possible they had possible um it was suspected tuberculosis we would have to put them in a special negative pressure room and we would have to wear a gown and we would have to wear a mask and sometimes we wore goggles um and but this was the thing every single time i went into that room i had to put that stuff on and before i walked out i had to take it off and then if i forgot a pencil or something i had to do it all over again and run back in for people that feel like they should, they should not have to wear a mask. My question is this, if I was your nurse and you were in the hospital and the other patient that I had, I had two patients that day, and the other patient that I had was that, that person with tuberculosis or possible tuberculosis. If I felt like I don't feel like wearing a mask today and I went in that room and kept going in and out of that room, but then I also was taking care of you. Mm -hmm. Would you feel comfortable with me not wearing a mask with that with that patient with uh, tuberculosis or possible tuberculosis coming in also taking care of you? Would that be okay? I don't believe so. And, and I was a surgeon and I was going to operate on you and I said, oh, I don't use a mask. And I just go from operation surgery to surgery and I don't use a mask. Would you pick that surgeon? No, you would not if you had any sense. No, no. Oh, yeah, I agree. We do have freedoms. You are free to not wear a mask at home all you want to. But if you are going to go to people's place of business, like I said, we all know no shoes, no shirt, no service. And so, yes, businesses legitimately have the right to tell you you have to wear a mask or you can't come in. I was like, it's not really that hard of a concept to understand if you think about it. Look, I have to wear a shirt. I have to wear shoes. This is no different. And if you don't like it, you don't have to partake of that business. It's as simple as that. Right. Exactly. And, um, and, you know, I, I keep seeing people say, you know, well, the mask is not, you know, the mask is not for you, you know, it's, it's for the other person. Actually, I, I, I don't agree with that because I believe that the mask is for both of us because if you don't, if that other person doesn't wear, if you don't wear a mask and the other person has on a mask, you still have that, that makes um, that other person at, that has on the mask 
they still have a high risk of getting it from you because you don't have on one. So if we both have on, on one, then transmission is a lot lower. It's like 5% or something. Um, and so anyway, so I'm definitely a mask person. Um, I wear two masks half the time. Um, I just double them up, you know, because I want to be oh, sure. Mask it. I double mask it, you know. Um, and I got so, my bag here and I, I have my mask. Yes, 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 yes. Just you know. the right thing to do for yourself and for your loved ones. Yeah. Um, we know that we think that like up to a third of transmission is from people who are having no symptoms. You can have no symptoms of COVID and pass it on to somebody who can't have symptoms and will yes. subsequently die. So yes. just because, oh, I'm not coughing, I'm not having a fever, that doesn't mean that you don't have COVID, that you could could be fatal to somebody that you love or fatal to somebody that you don't know. But like I said, we got to be more focused on being humans, humankind in this country. Um, I had a patient who was from another country, one where they guarantee health care as a human right. Pick one because it could have been any of the other industrialized nations in the world because they all offer universal health care except for the U.S. Um, but he said li living in the U.S., he noticed that there wasn't a, as big of a sense of unity in the U.S. as it was in his country. He said mm -hmm. he was a higher income earner and he paid a little bit more ta in taxes, but he said he didn't even think twice about it so that other people can have health care. Because he said when him and his loved ones get sick, they have health care too. So he has a little bit more, so he's not concerned about paying a little bit more so right. that people less fortunate than him can have health care. And he said that in the U.S., it's, it's, it's more divisive. They don't have the sense of, of we're all in this together. And that's what Medicare for All does. It says, look, we are all in this together as humans, as human beings. If you get sick, we got your back. As opposed to Medicare for all who want it or public option. It's basically saying you're on your own. If you don't know uh, what website to go to on what date and what time, you are not going to have health care. You are all on your own. But Medicare for all says, look, we are all in this together as human beings. And that's the way it should be. Well, and then, you know, when the person that, when our, our mail carrier brings the mail, I don't, I can't name a day that I had to run back out and say, hey, you forgot my payment. You know, so we all receive our mail and we don't give the postal worker a dime. We, you know, that, that just happens. You know, the street sweeper comes and, you know, they sweep the street and that just happens. You know, so to feel like we are, you know, um, you know, like this should, this is something that people should have to pay for. And if you're lucky enough, you know, I've had people tell me that, you know, on calls, they'll say, you know, well, Corey, I love your policies. I love that you stand for $15 an hour minimum wage. I love that you're fighting for um, environmental justice for all and, and you're, you're a pro-choice candidate. I love those things. And you're fighting for, you know, to reinvest money into public school systems and all of these things. But that Medicare for all thing, you know, no, I have a great job and, you know, you know, and, you know, I have great care and I don't want to lose that um, switching over to Medicare for all. And, um, and they'll say, and I don't believe people should have anything for free. And then I bring up the, the mail carrier thing, but then also I, I let them know. And I think that if you're a firefighter, you're deductible before he comes and puts out your fire. Right, exactly. You know, and, and then I let them know, well, this is the thing. Um, you won't lose uh, people. A lot of people think that they're going to lose their doctor. Like I love my doc. They people say, I love my doctor. I love where I go. I love the service. You won't lose that at all. You get to keep that. And this, this is one thing that will change. So as the nurse, um, I've been the, the staff nurse and I've also been the director of the facility. Um, so as the staff nurse, I was the one that had to take care of you in the room, but then go sit on the phone with Medicaid or go sit on the phone with Medicare and, and ask, can you have this done? And then I'm on the phone for an hour. And so now I'm taking, now you have to sit longer because I have to sit here on this phone and it's happening over and over and over again. And then as the director, I'm the one saying, um, administration, I don't have enough staff because I have, you know, because the nurses are always gone on the phone trying to, you know, get stuff for patients instead of being able to provide patient direct patient care. Um, and so Medicare for All will take that away. Right now, yes. with COVID-19, we have, um, we have nurses who are nurses and doctors and, um, oh, shout out to, um, you know, our um, housekeeping staff, shout out to our, you know, wow. Radiologists who are doing our laundry, washing doctors' coats and scrubs and all the essential workers. Absolutely. The, the, the couriers and just everyone, everybody doing transportation, um, our, our um, public transportation people. Um, um, shout out to all of them. But, um, you know, when I think about how 
what ha what happens what happens to them you know right now we've been fighting for a better wage for the same group of people we've been fighting for health care for this same group of people and now this is the group of people that have to be there on that front line so what happens to them that's why we've been fighting and i'll say people may say well corey you know you keep saying the same thing over and over again it's because it's true it's true. truth don't change it, it hasn't changed nobody brought home medicare for nobody brought home making sure that everybody has health care um one thing that um that uh, it breaks my heart is when I was working in mental um, in uh, mental health mm. and I would have youth at our youth site that could not go to school. The school would say, hey, you can't come back until you have medicine. You have to have your, you know, your medicine to be able to sit in class. So you can't come back. The child goes to the doctor and then the doctor um, prescribes the medicine after they could wait three, four months to get the appointment. The doctor prescribes the medicine and then Medicaid says, or whatever they have, they have says, I'm not going to pay for it. So then the parent has to pay for it and the parent doesn't have the money. And then, so now the child can't go back to school. So now we have a child that's sitting out. And so that is another thing that feeds into something that we've been fighting for too, the breaking the school to prison pipeline, yeah. tearing it up, you know, but this is how we do this. This is how it happens when we keep, we, we are the ones that are supposed to take care of our youth um, and uh, Medicare for all wipes all of that away. Medicare for All says if mom moves, because right now her life is, she's living this really transient life and things are going on. If mom moves and she misses that Medicaid uh, notice, she won't lose her health. He, that child won't lose their health care. Like, of course, people forget about with the Affordable Care Act. Yes, it is a good thing that kids can stay on their parents' health insurance because they're 26. But the way we deliver health care now is if you live in Michigan, you, you're, you might have a really good health care company in Michigan. But let's say you go away to school in St. Louis. And then in St. Louis, is not a popular health care plan. So I've had um, college students who go away to college and they cannot get the care that they need because yes, in Michigan, everybody accepts their insurance, but they move to this new state and they're like, what is that plan? We don't accept that plan here. Yep. And so it's like, what is, how, what good is insurance if you can't find anybody to accept it? <laughs> so it's like, it's not assurance. <laughs> you should be able to go across state lines right. and still have the same care and still have lots of options to be covered. Right. And when you're talking about, you know, being on the phone and just the paperwork that's involved with private insurance. Okay, let's say I need to get you a CAT scan or MRI with Medicare. You know what I have to do? I write you the order. You go and get it. But if you have a private insurance, we have to get something called prior authorization. What is that? I gave my authorization when I gave you the order. Right. You have to call somebody. I have to call somebody who's not a doctor, not a nurse, had zero medical training at all, doesn't know medical terminology. So when I'm telling them the history and saying words, they don't understand how to spell them because they had no medical terminology. And I have to beg these people to, to, to cover the imaging. I had a, a lady just um, the other day who I needed to make sure she didn't have a blood clot in her lungs. That would kill her. And um, so I, I get on the phone, I talk to this young person who has no medical knowledge and I go through this checklist and at the end, oh, okay, yeah, I guess she really does have the risk factors to qualify for this CAT scan. I guess she does have the risk factors for a pulmonary embolism. You don't say, I'm the doctor. I told you she had the risk factors. That's why I ordered the test. But I got to convince you. I got to spend an hour convincing you hmm. that she really does have the risk factors that I know she has as a doctor who went to school for 20 something years. Right. So it's just all this red tape. At the end of the day, the private insurance company's game is to deny, deny, deny. There have been healthcare CEOs who came out flat and said, when I do these things like prior authorization, they just stamp them, deny. They don't even read them. There's been people who worked in healthcare administrators who admit it. We don't even read them. We just reject them all. They're total end game is to deny you care to save them money. Um, that's all they want. And when people say, um, I don't want to lose my private health insurance because I like it. When you ask them why they like it, they usually say things like, it doesn't cost me a lot of money, or I can see any doctor I want to and not have to pay any out of network fees. And so the reasons why they like it are things that are going to apply to Medicare for all. With Medicare for all, you can be able to go to any doctor, any hospital, any pharmacy you want to. Because right now I'm seeing more and more people whose insurance companies are telling them, you can only go to ABC Pharmacy. You can't go to XYZ Pharmacy anymore. You can't even pick your own dang pharmacy with some of these health insurance companies. But with Medicare for All, you can. You're going to be able to see any doctor you want to go to any pharmacy. It's going to cover mental health. It's going to cover dental. So teeth won't be luxury bones anymore. So 
when they say, I don't want to give it up because I like it, you have to explain them, well, Medicare for all is going to be just as good as your insurance or even better. Medicare for all, it's a gift. Let's say you had $5 and I had $10. And I say, you know what, Corey, why don't you give me that $5 bill? I'm going to give you, this, my, give you my $10 bill. We're going to swap. Did I take $5 away from you, Corey? No, I gave you $5. I gave you a gift. And that's what's helping with Medicare for all. We are not taking away anything. We are swapping it out for something that's going to be just as good or for the vast majority of Americans, way better. Because everybody has these surprise bills and out-of-network fees. I have, considering how bad health insurance is in the U.S., I today have kind of a good insurance because I don't need referrals and stuff. But still, there's still some hidden out-of-network fees that come, in, that come into play. So at the end of the day, I have wealth care. If I can afford all these fees, I can do whatever I want to. I don't have health care. I have wealth care. Um, so we need to get rid of that. Medicare for all is a gift. And, and see, one thing we have uh, right now with going back to COVID-19, um, I think about the day. So when I came home from the hospital, from my second hospital stay with, with this pneumonia, um, and th the pneumonia I had, you know, um, Dr. Dooley, and in a minute, we're going to open it up for questions um, in a, just a few minutes. Um, you know, the, the pneumonia that I had mimicked. COVID so much, so much. Um, COVID pneumonia. Yeah, you know, um, and, uh, but because my test came out negative, you know. Um, the test that's only about, we think, 65 to 70% accurate. So 30% exactly. of the time is gonna be falsely negative, that test. That test, that test. <laughs> and um, so, but when I came home from the hospital, uh, the next day, my bills started to come to my house. Like, so I'm getting the bills. I'm not well yet, and my bills are already roll, uh, just pouring in. Um, and just the idea that uh, I'm not well, I'm still fighting this, the bills are coming in. Um, what, you know, um, what am I supposed to do with that? People are dealing with that all the time, especially those that, because there are so many people who have said, I have so many people have, who have said to me, Corey, I have these symptoms and it's just like COVID or I wasn't able to be tested or I did get tested and it was a negative, you know, but I really feel like I have it. And so under the, you know, when people say, oh, you know, there was this whole thing about, well, if you, if you have COVID, we're going to make sure, try to make sure that that is paid for, that, you know, your treatment is paid for. But what about the people who didn't have COVID, who had, um, whose symptoms mimic that and still had those hospital stays, um, still had, you know, um, got, have these huge bills? What do we do with that? You know, so this whole thing, we would not have this happening right now at all. This would not be a situation if we had Medicare for all. I'm not, um, I'm not that type of person to wait for something to be popular, to, ad to advocate for, or to wait for somebody else to see who else is going to join in with this, to, you know, who else, you know, I, I, I don't need to help rats. What'd you say? You're a woman of integrity. Yeah, I mean, yeah, people, people need what they need. We need what we need. And so I'm going to go out and fight for it and try to get that for you because you need it now. You know, you can you can say what you want about me, but you'll be happy with me later when you get what you need or when your sister got, gets it. You, ain't, you didn't need it, but your sister got it. And now she didn't have to come to you and ask you for the money or for whatever it is. So you'll be happy later. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll make you angry now, but you'll be happy later with what comes with with what um, comes out of it. So, um, and that's what we did with Medicare for All. Uh, well, that's what we're trying to do with Medicare for All. The person that's sitting in the seat right now that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to win hasn't done anything. Signed up, said, okay, yeah, I support it. But nobody knows. The people in the district, if you're not really digging into this person's um, voting record, you would know that this person is fighting for Medicare, it, it uh, supports Medicare for All. If, MSN, if MSNBC calls me, they're going to hear about Medicare for all. They're going to hear about CNN. Whenever I'm on those shows, they hear about what I what I support. There is no question. I'm going to talk about it because I'm trying to bring that thing home. Um, so let's open it up to some questions. Um, we'll go. We'll take about ten minutes. And um, uh, what do what do you want to know? You got me and Dr. Dooley. Um, is it you want to? Um, yeah, I messaged you a couple of questions that already came in. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. See, I was so into it. I wasn't looking at my phone. It's on the chat. It's on it's your on chat. chat. Okay. It's on the chat. So let's see. Okay. Uh, 
I'm assuming the opiate crisis was made worse because of lack of unified health care tracking. Absolutely. And also, um, the opiate crisis is affecting a lot of rural um, rural people. And um, we talked about not believing Black women and Black patients. Um, we believe that um, healthcare providers, ER doctors were less likely to give black patients opioids because they didn't believe them, right? So um, they were more willing to believe the white people who had pain and gave them more opioids. And the fact that they believed the white people more and gave them more opioids actually contributed to the opi opioid um, epidemic uh, disproportionately affecting white people and rural people. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, you need mental health care and mm -hmm. physical health care. Even when you think of something like COVID, um, you can get over the physical symptoms, which I'm so glad you have, sister. But just the long lasting effects, the fatigue, the medical bills, those are gonna cause stress and you might need some counseling or some mental health services. So we can say, okay, we're gonna cover your COVID. But what about all the mental health ramifications that come after the COVID? You're not gonna cover those. It makes no sense. Um, our bodies are not these separate pieces. It's all one, our mind, our body, our spirit, whatever you believe in, it's all one. Our teeth are not separate from the rest of our body. And so that's why we all need and deserve comprehensive coverage. Yes. Um, there was another question I think would be um, better for you to answer, Dr. Dooley. Um, from Christy W. How accurate do you think the antibody testing is? I would say I think that it is because it's, 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 it's immun immunoglobulin, right? Um, um, it, it's complicated. Uh, the, the, it depends on the manufacturer and their data, um, but the general consensus is, is to approach the vast majority of those tests with some caution. Um, and, okay. and there's the antibody tests? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Oh, wow. I didn't know that. And depending on the particular, particular test, and each test should tell you something called a sensitivity and specificity. So, so these tests um, by certain manufacturers, they're going to have a percent that are falsely negative, meaning you really did have antibodies, but it didn't pick up on it. And it's going to have another percent of people who are falsely positive, meaning you didn't have antibodies and you're going to have some. So COVID is so new. We need to do work on not only our COVID testing, but our antibody tests. And so if you have a positive antibody test, depending on which test it is, you want to ask about the sensitivity and specificity. Um, you shouldn't say, oh, I have COVID antibodies. I'm going to not wear a mask and just go out there and, you know, not worry because I'm immune. Um, at this point, we are, the vast majority of, especially those rapid tests, aren't um, there at 100%. So I, I would approach those results with caution. And then whoever is administering the test for you, they should have all the data about how often it's falsely negative and falsely positive in people. And they should be able to provide that information for you. Yeah, I, I just saw um, an article, maybe some of you have um, seen this article as well, came out, I think one day late last week, or maybe early this week, uh, it was talking about one company in particular, very well known um, um, medical equipment company. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that their tests, their COVID-19 tests um, are for, were 48%. Um, there were, you know, there was an error, error in 48% of them. Mm -hmm. So um, half the people that took them, you know, got the right answer. The other half basically didn't. Uh, so official if you have mild symptoms, but if you have severe symptoms, if you have x-rays like yours were CAT scans that show the viral pneumonia in both your lungs, if you are young and, you know, otherwise relatively healthy and there's no other, your flu is negative, all your other uh, virus panels are negative. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. Just like if it walks and talks like COVID in this day and age, it is. Yeah. Um, and so that's the way the, that way map, the majority of doctors are proceeding. I've had people go to the ER and they get the x-ray and the findings consistent with COVID, but their test is negative. But in their discharge summary, um, they're saying pneumonia, suspect COVID. Um, you know, the test wasn't accurate, but that doesn't mean that we still aren't suspecting that's the cause of it. And um, with, the, the, with the nasal swab specifically, they're not as accurate. Um, sometimes people are in the hospital and the nasal swab is negative twice. Um, but then if they get sicker and the doctors end up having to do a bronchoscopy where they, you know, they go down into their, their bronchioles, into their lungs and take, take a sample from inside their lungs, that's when they get the positive. So it's no longer maybe in your nose, it's all in your lungs. So of course you're going to get a negative test from your nose because now all, everything is going on is going on in your lungs. So, um, yeah, you, you shouldn't use any of those tests as of right now until they get better to say 100% 
um, you know, I'm safe because I, I already have antibodies or I already had it. So I can just go out and wild out because I'm already immune. Yes. Yes. And we also have to, like with my very first test um, as a nurse, uh you know i just knew that i you know my first one didn't go well you know the person didn't go back far enough um they didn't go back as um, far as far as even a flu um swab which that is not it depends supposed to be. on how good the person is at doing it you're right it just depends on how good is the person at getting your swab are they kind of timid and they aren't really going back there they kind of kind of got to feel like it's hitting your brain almost and it felt like the second one lord <laughs> right, right, right so so it's it, it's it's stressful. People want answers and people deserve answers. But like I said, at the end of the day, most doctors are going by the walks and talks like COVID. It is regardless of what the, what the test is. Okay. We have a question from Joe Kunstler. My daughter is a resident dermatologist. Will doctors be somewhat protecting, protected from lawsuits under Medicare for all? Um, I don't know details about what you, what it specifically you mean by protected for lawsuits, but, um, uh, a large portion of doctors' malpractice insurance, we all have, as physicians, have to carry malpractice insurance, and depending on your specialty, that can range from tens to, you know, ten to several tens of thousands of dollars a year. And the reason, part of the reason why we have to pay so much of that is because if you harm somebody and they need health care for the rest of their life, just like with auto insurance, um, then they're going to have a large amount of medical bills, right? And because we don't guarantee health care as a human right, they have to build in some of that cost of lifelong medical care in the cost of your malpractice insurance. So if you are a practicing, practicing physician, it's not going to say, oh, no, doctors aren't going to be liable at all if they do gross negligent malpractice. Um, but it should lower the malpractice costs to the physician because then you no longer have to account for paying for this person health care for life because their health care is already covered for life. Okay. Um, I see. Go on, I think we. I know we have some more. We have quite a bit um, in here. Let's see. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody was saying they want to see your uh, see our our um. $24,000 ice maker. I'm not going to, to, to let you get into that. <laughs> we know what my story about innovation, I'm not trying to dismiss it, but that's also thrown, you know, the U.S. is the most innovative country in the world. And if we have Medicare for all, we're going to lose those innovative research and drugs. I know. These drugs are mostly funded by taxpayer dollars. We pay to fund the research for these new medications. And then what do pharmaceutical companies do? They jack up the prices to tens of thousands of dollars when a new medicine comes out. So we are paying for this innovation, but we're yeah. not getting any credit for it. So with Medicare for all, we still, some of the cost of this innovation is going to be in taxpayers, but we're going to benefit from it because then when a medicine comes out, we're not going to have to pay huge cost. Yep. Um, and, then, and then also you have to think about what is the point of being in a country that is allegedly um, so innovative if nobody can afford the medication? Who, ca who cares if it's an innovate, innovative medication, life-saving medication that you need if it costs $250,000? Right. $40,000 a year. You're not going to get that medication. I don't care how innovative the medication is. If you cannot afford it, you don't have it. That's Access it. is not <laughs> care. So uh, that's just a myth that um, Big Pharma, Big Health Insurance likes to put out there and to scare us and to cause some fear mongering. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's just taxpayers fund this medical research and we're not getting any benefit by funding it. Um, whereas with Medicare for all, we will get the benefit because we won't have to pay these astronomical costs. Uh, Dr. Bill um, makes a really good point. Um, we're going to do a couple more questions and then we're going to close out. We're not going to keep you all. We're going to try to our best to stick with the time. Um, but this is so good and you all have such great comments and questions um, here. Um, Dr. Bill says also Medicare for all means patients are less apt to refuse recommended treatments, cut pills in half or not get prescriptions filled at all. Better compliance means better outcomes and fewer lawsuits. So that is such a huge deal because you know, I, I, a lot of my patients would do that. And I'm like, you know, you're at, you know, you're paying, you're supposed to be taking this much insulin and you're only using this much, you know, and they're trying to ration that insulin. And I'm like, you, 
that's not how it works. Like you can't not take the amount that you need and still be, be still be healthy. Um, so uh, yeah, that's a great point. Um, Excellent point. But, how it's like some people they won't even tell me that they're not taking their medications because you know it's embarrassing to tell your doctor you can't uh afford your medication so all people come in they're like oh yeah doctor i swear i'm taking the medicine but with electronic medical records nowadays i get pushed pharmacy data so i can see when you last fill your medicine and they swear up and down that they took it and i'm not saying that they're doing that because they're liars they have their own reasons they, it's embarrassing it costs you know they're scared they don't they think if they tell me i'm not gonna have an option to help them so what's the point and reveal that information so that i get on the phone i call the pharmacy you know when's the last time the patient filled this medicine six months ago and so then i have to come back and say look you know i know you're not taking the medicine i called the pharmacy i get the data into the computer system there's absolutely zero way you are taking these medication if you could just explain to me why i can help you find a way to uh get an alternative or even get that medication treated some people don't realize that certain pharmaceutical companies will have prescription assistance programs and some of them are stricter than others but a lot of them are fairly generous as far as what income level that you can make up to and get some assistance to get the medication free mailed to you for free and so you know if they explain to me you know i can't afford it i can either switch them to something else or i can see you know this particular pharmaceutical company will give it to you for free if you make less than this. You don't have to tell me how much you make, but I'm going to give you these papers. And if you fit these income guidelines, I want you to fill them out and return them. So it's important to communicate with your doctor. Um, and if you have a doctor that you are scared to tell the truth to because you are going to be embarrassed or you think they're going to talk down to you, that's an excellent sign that you need a new doctor. Yes. 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 So many people um, I've seen, they'll go in and um, won't tell the doctor something, but then they'll come out and tell the nurses, you know, and then we have to go back in and tell the doctors, this is what's really going on. And they're like, you know, now I have to start over with what I was, you know, what I was doing. So yeah, switch doctors. But, you know, if anybody is in Novi or anywhere near it in Detroit, near Detroit, go see my sister. I'm telling you, she is a phenomenal, phenomenal doctor. And I just absolutely, you are amazing. You saved my life. Absolutely. Oh, Courtney, no, I did, but... Oh, I like I said, I you touched my heart so much because like I said, I was you in 2011. I was, I did not have health insurance. And if I didn't have uh, colleagues who were willing to take care of me, you know, I'd be in a ton of debt or I just would have got sicker. So, you know, you're my sister. I love you. I'm always going to be there for you, girl. You ain't getting rid of me no matter what. So, <laughs> so and, and my clinic is, you know, the clinic that I was sent to um, after discharge from the hospital is closed. And so I didn't have a doctor. People keep saying, Who's covering your care? Who's why, who's taking care of you? And I'm like, you know, I call Dr. Dooley because, you know, so Dr. Dooley's like, hey, use your nebulizer more, do this, do that, because I don't, you know, I don't have anybody local. So, you know, thank you for being there. People just don't know. We have such, so there are some just really great doctors and shout out to you as a black woman doctor. You know, we need so many more um, that understand our issues and um, we need people of color. We need people that are, you know, we need people that are trans doctors. We need so many, we, we need everybody to feel represented. That's why college should be free so that you don't have to incur 250 Fifty three hundred thousand dollars of debt just yes. because you had the dream of being a doctor. Exactly. Um, we're gonna take these. Yes, I do telemedicine appointments, Shannon. I do do telemedicine appointments during the pandemic. So as long as insurance companies are gonna keep paying for them, and hopefully they'll keep, continue to pay for them forever now, um, because this pandemic is gonna last for a long time. And it's gonna be another one eventually. So um, we absolutely do do telemedicine visits, and you know a lot of doctors are small businesses, and some um, small some of them did close because a lot of the staff got COVID or the doctor got COVID. Fortunately, my staff and I did not. We had been tested. We did not get COVID so far, um, and we are you know practicing safely. We're wearing our masks, social distancing, cleaning. We're seeing COVID patients by telemedicine. We're not having them come into the office just to limit exposure to the to our well patients. So. So we have a few more questions. We're going to try to get through these really quickly, but I want to make sure everybody gets their questions answered. Um, one is about vaccinations, about um, in and um, uh, uh, let's see. This one is um, from Sarah Kett, um asking about um, people just being concerned that people may not um, want to get the vaccination once it's available, um, and just how you know how we would frame its importance. Um, one thing about that, Sarah, I will say is it's a, that, that, that is a little difficult depending on the community that you're talking to because not everybody is 
um, runs towards vaccinations, even though they may be there and, and we may see good in that. Um, a lot of people don't get the pneumonia vaccine. A lot of people don't get the flu vaccine, um, especially in the black community. Vaccines are, you know, once you get past the baby, <laughs> the, 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 those first couple of years, it's hard, you know, the, those but other vaccines. Talk about why, because yes. we as a people have a lot of reasons to be distrusting of the healthcare community. And yes. if you don't have a doctor, and, and studies have shown, if you have a doctor who looks like you, you have better outcomes. So since we don't have enough black doctors and nurses, mm -hmm. and every black person doesn't have a black doctor that they feel comfortable with, that's part of the reason. We have a lot, doctors don't believe us when we go to the ER and things. So we have a lot of reasons not to trust the medical community, but you also have to think about it in my office, Office, um, my medical assistant, she's surprised. She's like, because she'll ask you if you want the vaccine as soon as you get there. And then I'll go in the room and I'll explain to you why it's important and explain to you, address your myths, because there's a lot of bad information out there. The internet is wonderful, but it's also horrible because anybody with a <laughs> rear end and opinion can get on there and blog and spread misinformation. So she's shocked. She's like, Dr. Julie, you know, I always ask for people for vaccines and they say, no, you, you go in there, you change their mind. I'm like, well, you know, because I'm a, pa I'm a parent first before I'm a doctor and I research vaccines before I give my kids and I give my kid every recommended vaccine after I've researched it. Um, but when I go explain to them, address their myths, sometimes people are concerned about mercury, explain to them, number one, there's no mercury in any vaccine that I carry in my office. We carry preservative free single dose vials. You will not get any. So mercury doesn't cause autism, number one, but let's say hypothetically, you are still believe that it does you will not get a thiomersal containing vaccine in my office. And it costs me a little bit more to buy those individual bites, doses. And I do it not because scientifically it's the right thing to do, but morally, because people have legitimate concerns. They might be false concerns, but they're legitimate concerns. So when I go in there and find out, not every time, but like I said, my medical assistant, she, she, she told me several times, she's shocked. I'll, she'll ask people and then I go in there and I'll talk to them. Um, and explain why it's important to get it. So um, it's not a lost cause for everybody. Some people can be persuaded with the correct information from a healthcare professional that they trust. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's right. Um, two more questions and then we're going to close out. Um, let's see, how can we get through to, a, to family members that aren't taking COVID-19 seriously? Um, you continue to, I'll say you continue to take it seriously and show how serious you are. One thing that I've seen that has helped other people to, you know, when people are not, you know, um, if I feel strongly about something and the people that are closest to me um, or people that are in my circle aren't feeling, you know, don't feel the same way, I stay diligent. I stay, um, you know, um, in the fight for that thing. And once they see that, you know, a lot of times that that'll help. Um, also, you know, just being serious about, and I don't know if you live with, um, who is this? Uh, Danielle. Hey, Danielle. Um, I don't know if those people live with you or not, but, you know, if they don't live with you, then you can't come around me if you're not wearing a mask. You know, you can't. Um, I know there is this, uh, and I'm not telling, look, I'm not telling anybody to do this, but there is, <laughs> there is a comedian by the name of Lunel. I love her. She's hilarious. She had a child who, I believe it was her child, who wouldn't, wouldn't adhere to, you know, social distancing and all of that. She put it on Instagram and said, you know, yes, I put my daughter out and I told her she can't live here. She can't come because, you know, um, I want to live and I want my partner to live. And um, and so since you won't abide by it, you can't be in my home. Uh, and so uh, so I think I think when people see uh, how serious we are, you know, that that'll make a change. Now, if they live with you, you know, I don't know. Dr. Dooley, do you have a better one for that? Anybody want to pop something? Oh, you're not ever ever going to be able to convince everybody um there are cases of individuals who are at those protests um yeah. uh, to open states and they were out there uh the leaders of the protests and then a week later oh they got COVID some of them even died from COVID after going to those protests about opening up the states so some people you just aren't going to be able to convince and that's okay, okay. um but to stand your ground, like you said, and 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 to do what you know is right. Um, and it's a sad thing that some people don't take it seriously, but at the end of the day, um, that's on them. Your conscience can be clear, um, and you just have to do what is right for you and, be, and lead by example. All right, and this is our last question, then we'll close out. 
from Shannon Roberts. I am a nanny with no health insurance, no health coverage. My children are grown. When I apply for health insurance, they wanted to charge me $600 a month insurance. I pay out of pocket if I get sick. I tested negative for COVID, but had all the signs of COVID. Will the Medicare for All take care of me as a nanny? Yes, it will. It all needs all. We're not leaving nobody behind, Shannon, baby. Everybody. Nobody. It takes care of our unhoused population. It takes care of those 19-year-olds that didn't go to college. It takes care of the 87-year-old that has five different um, uh, pre-existing conditions. It takes care of the six-year-old. That It takes care of every single person all the time, all the time. Like, you don't, you can, you can switch 12 jobs. You can, whatever. Work, don't work, move, don't, work. don't move, you're covered. Exactly, and you don't have to. Mm. And undocumented people, and some people say, yeah. don't feel like undocumented people should be covered. And that's your opinion, but think about, think about the COVID pandemic. So let's say everybody was covered, but undocumented people. So COVID doesn't care if you're documented or not. No. So you undocumented, you get COVID, we don't treat you, you go around spreading it to people who are documented. Why does that make any sense? Exactly. Our living, breathing human being, that's all it takes to qualify for Medicare for all. Absolutely. And then we have so many, we have a lot of people, and I'll shut up about this. We have a lot of people who went into the military for, for those two things. You know, they went into the military for um, because college they were, and healthcare. You know, in college, exactly. You know, and so that's a whole other subject. We, I guess we have to have a whole other Zoom on that one. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just want to, so thank you to each and every person that decided to come on this call. Um, and thank you, Dr. Dooley, so much. Thank you for standing by me. Thank you for, you know, um, you know, let me say this. Check out Dr. Dooley's Twitter. Dr. Dooley's Twitter is always on fire. And Dr. Dooley, let me say, she has to, she has to, um, she has to also deal with other doctors, her colleagues, you know, and so that aren't always in a, they don't agree, you know, oftentimes with what she's talking about, but she's winning. She's winning people, you know, so, but check out her Twitter. It's awesome. Like you will be laughing, but you'll learn. So um, it's like, wow, people, and I have seen people comment like, um, you are a doctor saying this, you know, it's funny. <laughs> human being, right is right. I don't care what your occupation is. Right is right and wrong is certainly wrong regardless of what your occupation is. And, and ultimately I'm a human being. Yeah. And that's why, um, like I said, I have a pro small practice. My patients are like family. We talk, they ask me about our my kids. I ask them about their kids. And, and, and that's the way it should be. We got to get out of this mindset that, oh, doctors are these like white coat wearing stiff people and they're not real, real people and they can't crack a joke and they can't smile and have fun because health is serious. Like, no, you can be professional, but you can also be down to earth and approachable and a human being and compassionate. And like I said, at the end of the day, right is right and wrong is wrong, no matter how many letters are behind your name. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so as, as we close out, I'm running for Congress um, so that I can directly address the, uh, many of the issues we discussed today, these issues and so many more. Um, for me to get there, I need your help. We're, we're going to do more panels like this. We'll, you know, we'll do a lot more, but this, this is what's happening right now while I'm running. My, my desire is to do this while I'm in office. So that's the whole thing. Like, I don't want to be what everybody else is being. I'm not that person that have to, you know, I, I just, I want to be what we need. I, I look at it like this. What would I like to see from my congressperson? What would I, what do I want from my congressperson? And this type of, this type of thing, I would love to have from our congressperson all the time, you know? And so this is something that I would like to carry on with. But for me to get there, I need your help. I need your help. If you can volunteer, um, there are ways you can volunteer, coreybush.org Corey um, forward slash um, volunteer. Um, if you want to um, help us, we need people making phone calls. You, may, you don't have to be local. You can make call, phone calls from where you are. You can do postcards. So many things that you can do. We really, really need your help. We have um, August 4th is our day. We have two months. Uh, and actually, people start voting in four weeks, in a month. Yeah. Um, our absentee voting opens up. So I really, really need your help. And also, um, to get across this line, I need help financially. We don't take any corporate money, not one dollar. Every dollar that comes into this, this campaign is, is totally just from individual um, donors. Um, 
if I win this seat, I will be the very first Black woman to ever go to Congress from out of our entire state, the history of our state. And this particular seat, there's never been a woman, regardless of what she looks like or where she comes from, there's never been a woman in this seat. 172, three, almost three years, there's never been a woman in this seat. Um, it's time. And so I'm not saying support me because I am a woman or because I'm Black. I'm saying that I'm a Black woman that has the ambition, that has the drive, that has the passion, that has the um, that has the um, the temperament and the courage to go ahead and step up and do this. And I also, you know, I I I, I think pretty well, so um, I can go ahead and do this job. So I'm asking for your help and your support right now. Um, you can go to www.coreybush.org. It's C-O-R-I-B-U-S-H dot O R G. Um, for slash donate to make a donation. You can donate a dollar. You can donate up to $2,800. I have two months left. Um, uh, are the things for, for us to buy, let me just say, um, when I ran in 2018, we did phenomenal in 2018. We didn't quite, quite make it, but uh, we did really well. I had signs, I had my yard signs. It cost, uh, 500 yard signs was $1,400. But they didn't have my picture on it. So people would see Corey Bush and they thought yeah. I was a white man. Uh, um, yeah, because they saw their last name Bush. And so they thought I was a white male Republican. Okay. Um, oh, and, no. You know, and so people would tell me afterwards, they were like, you're a Corey Bush? You know, so this time we put Democrat on there and we put my face on it. Um, and so now just putting my face on these signs, instead of it being $1,400 for 500, it's $4,000 for 500. Um, and so like we have radio ads and so many other things that we're trying to do and we just really need your help. We need to do mailers. Um, that The mailers are $30,000 one time you know, for each time we send them out. Um, so I just need your help. So if you would please donate, talk to your family and friends about, about me, about this race, uh, even about Dr. Dooley, you know, send her some, send her some patience. Um, talk to people about us. It's about, you know, word of mouth. Tell people to check out our, um, our social media. Um, uh, Dr. Dooley, what's your Twitter? At Dr. Dooley MD, at D R D O O L E Y M D. Yes, yes. Um, and the name of your uh, name of your uh, practice? Northville Novi Family Medicine. Yes, Novi. I keep saying Novi. It's Novi. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and I'm at Corey Bush on everything. You can just at C O R I B U S H to reach us. Also, um, if you need to send us some, if you need to talk to us, info at coreybush.org. Coming up, and this is the last thing coming up, um, we have some phone banks that you can join in with. Um, we'll drop the link in the chat. If you want to do some phone banking with us, we would love to have you. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening and we'll be back in a few days to do this again and we'll talk about some other stuff. You all are wonderful. I love you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your time. It's Friday night and you gave it to me. Thank you. Love you all. Yeah, I love you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.